you have spoken. The next speaker is Gay. She's uh, standing next uh, next to me here. She's the head of Oceania at the British Museum, Museum, the Oceania Department, I suppose, and an, an, an uh, Aboriginal woman from Tanzania, uh, from uh, Tasmania, uh, who works closely with Aboriginal communities. She's led on some of the most important um, exhibitions that have recently been curated on uh, the area, and she's also a member of the. Uh, national uh, native uh, title tr uh, tribunal and a co-investigator on several Australian Research Council funded research projects. And um, I'm going to hand over to you because I know that you don't need more introduction than that. Uh, but I think you know that her work is actually quite well known probably by many of you. But she'll talk, be talking about some more recent research in um, Irish collections. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much to the conference organisers for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Laura said, I am an Aboriginal woman from Tasmania, and I'd also like to acknowledge the presence today of my countrywoman, Zoe Rimmer, who's in the audience today. And although she isn't formally speaking, she's writing a, a terrific PhD on the development of Tasmanian Indigenous museology. And so do speak to Zoe. Since 2013, I've been curator of Oceania at the British Museum. And my talk today will be looking at some of the projects that I have been involved with, working very closely with communities in Australia and importantly with funding and universities uh, in Australia that has enabled much of this work to be done. Uh, these stone and glass knives made by Aboriginal people in the early 1880s were collected by Drogheda-born Edward Town Townley Hardman during his two years in the colony of Western Australia between 1883 and 85. Hardman was the Irish branch of the Geological Survey of the UK for a temporary post of geologist and was tasked by the colonial government with surveying for gold and other minerals in the Kimberley region of the northwest of the state. This is one of uh, Hardman's uh, drawings of Aboriginal country, but as seen by him as a geologist. Uh, failing to obtain the position of first colonial geologist, he returned to Ireland in 1885, taking with him a collection of Aboriginal objects. In 1886, he helped arrange the display of minerals from Western Australia at the Colonial and Indian Exhibition in London. Shortly after, in 1887, while surveying in the Wicklow Mountains, he contracted typhoid fever and died in Dublin, aged just 42. Hardman is just one of many illuminating transnational histories which encompass the collecting of Aboriginal objects that are now found in museums in the Republic of Ireland and in Northern Ireland, which have been highlighted in the Collecting the West project. Just to give you an idea of the scope, of um, Western Australia, particularly at the West, which I'm mainly talking about today. The Collecting the West project was initiated in 2016 by Professor Alastair Patterson and Andrea Whitcomb of the University of Western Australia and Deakin University, together with the major state collections, collecting institutions in Western Australia, the Art Gallery, Library and Museum, as well as the British Museum as an average, as a international partner. And it was funded for over four years uh, for about £370,000 uh, pounds. and it has about uh, has had about 22 investigators and researchers and four PhD students whose dissertations and publications have contributed to its outcomes. What is perhaps unique about this project is it's looking about how a study of using collections from the entire state um, can illuminate histories about the state. So the research has encompassed art, ethnography, history, natural history, photography, and museum histories. So its purpose has really been to, how can you understand the place where you live by looking at all the collections that come from uh, that place? And what implications does this have for the collecting institutions going forward? So it's not just about looking at the past and colonial histories, but also looking at the collections and what does it mean for the institutions going forward? 
Now, the international collections of Aboriginal material are critically important because Aboriginal collections were, like other people's material, exchanged all over the world. These are just some of the institutions. And for example, the earliest collection of plants from Western Australia were collected by William Dampier, who visited the northwest of the state in the 1790s, and his uh, plant collections he made from Western Australia are in Oxford. And so we've been having a series of workshops and publications and exhibitions at the new Western Australian Museum in Perth, if you have an opportunity to go there, and a new volume called Collecting the West is going to be published by University of Western Australian Press later this year or early next year. But the European history of Western Australia really pales into insignificance if compared to the Aboriginal history of the state dating back some 65,000 uh, years with over 250 language groups, a rich traditions of ceremonial life, and in recent years, um, a growing respect for these cultures and traditions. But from about 1826, British and Irish colonists such as Het Hardman arrived at the New Swan River colony, hoping to make um, their fortunes or work as public officials and pass through on voyages. And these are further drawings from Hardman in the Western Australian Library. And in researching the collections, it's, it's been fundamental to the work we've done to look at collections and how they relate in both countries. Because if you look at objects here and objects in Australia, you see them from different perspectives and it's really important to try and bridge those gaps. Um, in terms of Aboriginal uh, objects in Ireland, uh, the National Museum of um, Ireland and Ulster Museum together hold some about a thousand Aboriginal objects with about 600 objects in Dublin and 225 in Belfast. And most of these collections, uh, the beginnings of these came from earlier precursors to these institutions, such as the Royal Dublin Society and Trinity College in Dublin and in Belfast, the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical uh, Society founded in 1821. And um, in Dublin, most of the objects were collected in the 19th century, but in the Ulster the Museum, the objects are continued to be acquired well into the 20th century. Until recently, these collections have remained little research published on or, ex or exhibited. But a recent ex uh, exhibit, and I'm pleased that Winifred Glover is in the audience today because she did some fantastic work, um, particularly in the publication and the exhibition in 1988, called uh, an exhibition and publication called Travelling at Port Phillip, uh, which drew on her research on the early Aboriginal collections. And included in that book and published uh, more recently in a book I helped uh, co-edit and co-author is this amazing emu feather skirt made by Aboriginal people of the Melbourne region. And this was collected the year that the uh, Tasmanian uh, colonists moved over to Port Phillip. And while most of the um, these uh, emu feather skirts have fibre, uh, to hold on the feathers. This one has in this first year of colonization, the emu feathers are delicately held on with a piece of wire. And I think it's just an extraordinary object. So, and also I'm looking forward to Rachel Hand's uh, book on the Dublin collections, which will tell us more about those important collections. Uh, other important collectors from Western Australia include um, Emil Clement, who visited a mining engineer who visited the Northwest of the state and collected some 1,600 objects that he sold in sets to museums all over the um, uh, all over Europe. But there are many important objects, particularly from the Swan River region, in uh, collected by Irish people that are really important because um, there was no museum in Western Australia until 1891. So some of the earliest Aboriginal objects from still exist uh, outside of the state. Um, this uh, bag was collected by Samuel Neil Talbot and was given to the British Museum in 1839, one of about 90 objects he donated and his family came from Malahide Castle uh, near Dublin and he described this as an encyclopedic collection and being about almost 100 objects, it's incredibly diverse. And I think it was because his mother was English and he spent time in England as well as Ireland, he decided to donate these to the, his collection to the British um, Museum. 
Um, another very early object uh, in Ulster Museum here is this ridged club from southeastern Australia, directed by a wealthy um, Ulster traveller, Gordon Augustus Thompson, and he later uh, he visited uh, Melbourne, came back to Ireland, and uh, later returned to live and where he died in Melbourne. Uh, and one of the more recent collections that I've been researching is this uh, objects collected by ha Henry Cavendish Butler in the 1830s that are here in the Ulster Museum. And uh, one of the interesting things about researching Aboriginal collections here or in other museums in, in the UK is that some of the most significant collections are the ones with the least information because they came in at an early time. Records weren't necessarily good and we found some most incredible objects and they might just say Australia. But then if you start to look how they compare with um, other objects, you can narrow down where they come from, such as these mushroom headed clubs from coastal New South Wales. And doing this comparative work on the objects is really important because then it helps you know to which community you need to talk to uh, about these objects. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of those collections on Monday. Uh, as well, the archival records are critically important too because they do give you clues to who actually made these collectors. Because as you know, so often white collectors' names appear in the records, but um, uh, in the Western Australian Museum register, there is a note that's saying two hawks eggs were given by Bungaree. And Bungaree was an Aboriginal man from the Sydney region who travelled on a ship to the west coast of Australia with Philip Parker King. And there's a drawing here showing the eggs that he collected that were later came to be in the Western Australian Museum. So the archival records can be really important in telling the Aboriginal histories of these objects. And so many of the original collectors were really Aboriginal people, but their names remain um, unrecorded. So um, it's uh, in looking at who were the collectors um, it's in, and the context of collecting, in some cases, there were the same people had different experiences in different places. So some p objects could have been collected, such as by um, Captain Philip Parker King in a friendly exchange, yet in other places, uh, because his surgeon was speared, he actually deliberately stole a whole range of objects um, as retribution. And we don't always know the context and it's really important to do the archival work to look at uh, how and why objects were exchanged. Uh, Irishman George Fletcher Moore was a, a lawyer who migrated to the colony in 1830 and worked as a magistrate. And his name appears in early records in Dublin, although all the objects he collected are not yet identified. But we know through his writings that it was his close companion, Aboriginal man Weep, who taught him Aboriginal language and helped him collect artefacts. Moore's diary notes, I have been trying to do up a box of curiosities. Beginning at the bottom of the box, I first put in some bark of a tree that grows in swamps and the edges of the rivers here called the tea tree. Then I put a ring of black gum in it to give you an idea of how it grows. Um, and also a native hammer and knife, which Weep gave me. Um, Moore's diaries also incorporate, which I don't illustrate, a shocking illustration of the decapitated head of Aboriginal man Yagan that was stolen and sent to England. And other episodes of collecting indicate theft from Aboriginal camps after the owners had been killed. Moore also bought a barbed spear from a man called Yidamira for a piece of bread and a quartz arm spear from Waitung for a piece of bread and a spear, which had lost its bag. It lost its quartz end. This rare skin bag may be one of two to three bags Moore took from a crime scene, which he sketched in his journal. Mrs. Jane Webb of Lower Mound Street, Dublin, also donated objects lightly sent by her son, George Joseph Webb, but he was a close associate of Moore, and it may have been Webb or Moore who were the source of these objects. Some colonists, however, were troubled by the violence that they witnessed. For example, Edmund Power Daly, an Irish engineer who worked as a warden on the gold fields, was for some time a magistrate in the early 1980s. He um, attended a public hanging of three white men. 
um, of, of three Aboriginal men convicted of murdering three white men. And he was very troubled that proper procedures had not been followed and presided at an inquest to no avail. Dowley donated objects to Dublin in 1892. And this is a collection unlike others, um, not dominated by tools uh, or weapons, but which included more personal items such as waistbands, skirts, and this really beautiful pearl shell pendant, which was worn by a young man to indicate his betrothal to a woman. To a woman. So the very tender na nature of this love object really belies the really violent uh, conflict of the um, origins of its collection. Moving back to the geologist um, Hardley, um, he actually wrote in his short life, he did write one article explaining why he collected these objects. And the, he thought these objects would be of interest to members of the Royal Irish Academy and its audience due to the similarity to ones preserved in the Royal Irish Academy. He wrote, the resemblance of these Australian stone spearheads, hatchets, chisels and bone implements together with the character of the ornamental work on some of the wooden instruments is so strikingly akin to those of Irish prehistoric times that I think it possible some of our best archaeologists might be deceived by them, and yet they are things of yesterday. They are not only recent, but most recent. For instance, some of the spearheads are made of bottle glass, an article unknown to the natives of the Kimberley four or five years ago. Two of these were made for my instruction in the art by two natives of the Kimberley. He continued, it was by no easy means to induce the natives to part with articles with which must have cost them and trouble with the rude means at their disposal. But I've been able to some specimens which bear such a remarkable resemblance to ancient Irish weapons, they may be possibly of some value as throwing a little light on the manner of and the mode of using the stone and other implements of prehistoric times. Comparing them to ancient flint nappers of Brandon, he said, I think we must come to the conclusion that the Australian savage is a somewhat unappreciated man. But after the establishment of the Western Australian Museum in the early 1890s, like with some other museums around the world, there was the beginning of an exchange between the museum and other institutions, including the National Museum of Science and Art um, in Dublin. And following initial inquiries from Western Australia in 1909, um, Dublin advised that there were several stone crosses available um, for casting. And after much exchange, a, a plaster cast of um, this cross was received in the Western Australian Museum in 1911. And the local newspaper reported um, the announcement, announced that one of the, what was described as one of its finest acquisitions, a perfect model of the cross. The local press in Perth described it as an example of an art of a long dead time, and it may be doubted whether any Australian museum possesses anything more interesting than this great model. Due to the high it be placed under a special shed constructed uh, for it in the um, whale yard. And so while it was received in 1911, um, unfortunately, its history in Western Australia was quite short lived because in 1929 there was a huge storm and the roof fell down on the cross and it was uh, destroyed. Uh, but it, also in the um, 1910s, there was exchanges of many natural history items between Dublin and Western Australia. So the collect natural history uh, collections in Dublin do include um, really important natural history as well as Aboriginal objects. So um, really important collections that were sent from Perth. Uh, interestingly, in terms of objects sent from Perth, um, this is these were two stone knives. And if you just looked at the, uh, there were four were donated to the Western Australian Museum in 1911 and 12. And the Western Australian Museum had little information about these, but when our Collecting the West project um, went to Dublin and uh, saw these objects and saw this note saying, with these stones, the wild blacks cut in pieces the sails of my boat. 
And so this little note on these two little stone tools in Dublin uh, were used by Moya uh, Smith of the Western Australian Museum to do some more research about the context of the collecting of these four stone tools. And these were associated with um, uh, Father Nicholas, who worked at the Benedict Benedictine Drysdale Mission in the northwest of the state. And the mission boat was a lifeline for the mission to the world. And it, at this time, it was much confrontation with Aboriginal people who did not wish to join a mission. And Father Nicholas faced uh, isolation, floods and dissatisfaction. And what Moya describes as a a combination of oscillating tensions between his desires to interact with the locals and fear of them, compounded by tension with other priests and ongoing challenges to the ownership of the boat. So therefore, through Moy's research um, and looking at the, this little label in Dublin and the stone tools um, in Perth, um, these far from being unassuming stone flakes, these stone tools can also be seen uh, as symbols of Father Nicholas's loss and sense of personal failure and of the resourcefulness and resistance of the traditional owners of Napier Broom Bay and the mission um, area. So just some concluding things about reactivating these collections and working with communities. Uh, the Collecting the West project didn't set out to deal with issues of restitution and repatriation, but these issues are likely to arise when one uncovers materials unknown to the descendants of their makers. And of course, a critical first step is listening to the voices of the relevant First Nations people. But this may not be easy to do when objects do not have precise places of collection to enable the relevant community be, to be identified. So this is what makes it all the more important for holding institutions to have images and inventories online to facilitate identification and remote access. Um, the situation with collections here in Belfast and Dublin where provenance records are incomplete and labels contain little and sometimes incorrect information um, is certainly not unique to Ireland. But with um, my colleagues in Australia and through grants from the Australian Research Council. Um, this has enabled the British Museum to work with communities and organisations in Australia to get a lot of funding to bring people to um, the UK to work on collections. And so this has involved community engagement, publications, uh, workshops, artist visits, Indigenous research fellows, and much new uh, knowledge um, production. So Jill Andrews was one of a, an Indigenous research fellow who spent time researching objects made of uh, fibre in collections in England. And uh, she's published an article about her research in the book that was published by the British Museum late last year with uh, many Indigenous authors contributing to it. Um, we've also worked with our international partners, the National Museum of Australia, to work on an ex exhibition uh, in 2015, um, which sent 150 objects from the British Museum to uh, Canberra. But when we sent Aboriginal objects to Canberra, uh, very um, not surprisingly, because Australia is such a huge country, people said, what's the point of sending objects to Canberra? It's so far away. And particularly the community at Albany, um, they said, we want our objects to come home. So with the help of the Western Australian Museum, um, uh, 14 historic objects belonging to the Manang community uh, were lent to Albany, the branch of the Western Australian Museum, for this exhibition that was uh, curated locally by their community, Yulman, uh, which was an amazing experience for all involved, and the experience of the local curators has led to them being launched on uh, uh, excellent careers. Uh, another project that's happening at the moment is also from the, this same area of Western Australia, uh, the Menang uh, community is working with the Natural History Museum in London on a collection of fish and fish drawings because many of these have Aboriginal uh, language noted on them. So these um, fish specimens, fish drawings uh, can be used for used to study language, cultural practices, fishing techniques. So the natural history collections as well as the cultural collections are fundamentally important. Um, one of the other projects I'm working on at the moment is called Mobilising Aboriginal Objects. 
And while objects can be sent to exhibitions, the aim of this project is to try and find the earliest objects from the Sydney region surviving outside of Australia in the UK and Ireland. And um, this is a case where most of the earliest objects are just listed as Australia. And so by comparing objects to illustrations, we've now got a list of something like 100 objects that had previously not been identified as coming from the Sydney region, which is because it was the ground zero of British colonisation, uh, there's very few early objects from Sydney um, uh, remaining in collections in Australia. So just to conclude, um, so through these various projects and media attention given to the um, issue of repatriation of some key objects. There's much awareness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of objects that are held overseas. And if some individuals have had the opportunity to come and view them. And we have artists, community people, curators, community members, a whole range of people um, who want to come. And, but knowing where to go is really also dependent again on knowing where the objects are and the inventories and the images. And so work to research and document these requires um, input from curators in both countries and working with Aboriginal knowledge holders and archival material. So while today it seems that many museums are in a rush to use that buzzword decolonize or to return colonial era objects, um, you know, our team sort of issues a note of caution that if such work is rushed, it may not involve the right people or give the right people the time to consider the emotions and practicalities that such work involves. And repatriation to a country of origin is not necessarily repatriation to people of origin. Um, so in our experience, Aboriginal people wish to see objects from their region, but few objects from the 19th century have these precise places of origin recorded and often databases and records uh, contain significant errors or wrong assumptions. So establishing who are the right people to work with is a critical part of this work, which takes time. So by working collaboratively with our Aboriginal people and institutions in both countries, there is much to be learned about the history of each object, the circumstances of its acquisition and its historic and contemporary significance to both Aboriginal and other people. So working transnationally and cross-culturally, new funding possibilities emerge and new uh, collaborations can begin to enable many of these largely forgotten collections to emerge from their slumber. Thank you. <laughs>